Hi everybody, my name is Rob Stout. Um, this is my 2016 presentation of learning. So, a little bit of background info on myself. This is my first year in the E3 program. I was originally a Thompson student. I went um, all the way through elementary school uh, in the Thompson district. And uh, when I went into middle school and high school, we decided to switch over into the Pooter district. It was actually a pretty awful move. I flailed horrifically. I was having trouble keeping up with the workload. I had trouble dealing with organization, time management, procrastination, and it was just a miserable experience for everybody in the family. So towards the end of uh, last school year, my mom, who works in the district, had heard about this program through her coworker. Her coworker had said this would be a perfect fit for me. So we came over and talked to Diane to see what the whole thing was about, and after a handful more meetings, I had decided to come back into the Thompson District and become a part of this program. So early on into the summer, we had a meeting with my counselor over at Loveland High School to get a schedule laid out to see which credits I would pick up through where. And what ended up happening was I kind of got this odd hybrid schedule of online classes, E3 credits, and uh, brick and mortar classes over at Loveland High. So, I'm also an avid fly fisherman. That's a big reason that I came into this program was it was allowing me to take and use my passion area and really, I mean, expand upon it, learn how to turn it into a viable business and kind of get education out of something that I'm already doing and that I love. So the current academic plan that I'm running through with E3 is I'm attempting to pick up business work experience and intro to business through my mentorship uh, I am working on designing a website right now, so I'm hoping to get web design credit for that. And then kind of an oddball one that we found as we were looking through credits is Teen Challenges and Choices. And that's essentially just talking about how to deal with life around you and cope. So one of the big pieces of E3 is the mentorship. Uh, I didn't get into a mentorship until much later on in the season. We didn't find a mentor until uh, early December. But we did find uh, Kirk's Fly Shop and Kirk and Gary up in Estes, and they said it would be a great idea for me to come up and mentor with them. So the first trip that I ever made up there one weekend, we went and um, the first trip we made up there, uh, we immediately started talking fishing, started talking about a game plan, and um, uh, the conversation quickly turned to fly tying. Every uh, every weekend up at Kirk's Fly Shop during the winter, they have a fly tying class. And um, it got to a point where Kirk said, here, run outside, grab some boxes. So I ran out, showed him a couple things, picked out a couple patterns and said, okay, you're teaching the fly tying class in 30 minutes, go. So it took a little bit for me to calm the nerves back down, but as soon as I did, I started to meet everybody. And over the next few months that I was teaching the fly tying class up there, I really got to know everybody up there on a personal level, we got to learn their uh, skill level when it came to fly tying, and we tied all over the board from little tiny bugs, like, what is that, little, little tiny flies, like these ones right here, you can barely see that probably, all the way up to big crazy flies like this. And the ideas behind that was to kind of cover different skill levels, cover different techniques, cover different species and just kind of teach them to become overall better fly tires and overall better fly fishermen. So part of the reason that I didn't get into the business piece and the guiding piece, which is what I was really hoping to get out of the mentorship, um, part of the reason I didn't get into it right off the bat was because it was kind of the off season up there, tourism was low, the rivers were frozen up, and it just wasn't really a fishy season up there. But now that it's starting to warm up, tourism starting to pick back up in Estes, I've gotten the chance to go out and shadow a couple of guides, which was something that I was really looking forward to doing. That's one of the big things I was hoping to get out of this mentorship. So the two guide trips that I've gone out and shadowed on so far were with um, a wide, actually a pretty wide variety of clients. The first trip I went out on, the clients that we took out, was a husband and wife who had they'd been out fly fishing once. So I talked with the guide and I talked with them for a little bit and we decided fairly quickly into the day that I was gonna take the wife and guide her and the guy who I was shadowing was gonna take the husband and guide him. 
So right off the bat, the wife said that she wanted to outfish her husband on this trip. <laughs> she had been outfished the last time they went out and wanted to turn things around. So it took a couple of casts for her to get the casting stroke down, and I showed her a couple of techniques, and I think two casts after she really started to get it down, we had a fish in the net and she was grinning from ear to ear. So by the end of that day, not only had she outfished her husband, but she did it with some serious gusto. She caught 11 fish, his 10 fish, she caught two species, he only caught one, and she also managed to catch the two biggest fish of the day. One was 20 inches, one was 16 inches. And for those of you who don't know, the Big Thompson is not known for growing big fish. They average about that big, and anything bigger than that is pretty rare. So to get into those two big fish was really exciting for both of us. And I was kind of glad that she was able to. I picked out a couple of holes that were looking really good, put on a couple of flies that I had said they should be eating, and we got into those two really big fish. Another thing that I did through the fly shop was I got to go down to the International Fly Fishing Expo down in Denver early on this year. Now Kirk kind of took a lot of faith, put a lot of faith into me doing this as it's kind of him really putting his business out there into the public and spreading it to a wider audience. So I, uh, early on in the day, kind of hooked up with one of his head guides, his name is Jerry. And we were trying to sell fly rods to people walking by. Well, by the end of the day, I had gotten basically uh, my marketing technique down and I had sold just shy of $4,000 worth of fly rods. I sold the second most fly rods out of anybody there working at the booth and I didn't even work, I don't even work at the shop. The only person who sold more was Jerry and he sold just shy of $30,000 worth. But that was a great learning experience. I learned a lot about marketing, I learned a lot about customer service and just how to run a business and how to really sell to people, uh, learn what they want and kind of pick out different items for their skill levels and kind of make the right match for them. So these pictures are from my guide trips that I went out on. This right here was the first lady who I took out guiding. She outfished her husband. The second guide trip that I took out that day was a little different. Um, the man who we took out had a severe brain tumor and because of that he had short-term memory loss and a blind spot from this side of his eye over. So he had a lot of trouble seeing, a lot of trouble remembering, and he also had, had a lot of surgeries on his knees and arms so he wasn't the most limber person. So we ended up taking about 45 minutes to an hour to really get the ideas ingrained of how to cast, how to get that technique down, how to set the hook, how to watch for hits. And after a while, once he really started getting into it, it was an absolute blast. It almost became less about the fishing and more about three people just being out in the outdoors, kind of enjoying nature. And um, towards the end of the day, a big thunderstorm came rolling in, and we ended up having to actually sit in the guide's truck so that we weren't out in danger. And it literally went from a fishing trip to three guys just sitting there sharing life lessons and learning from each other. It was a really good time. And the way the day ended was actually really funny. We had about 20 minutes left in the trip, and he managed to hook up on one more nice fish. And um, as I went downstream to net it, the fish came unhooked, and the fly popped right up into my cheek and got stuck there. <laughs> so among the other things I learned that day, I learned how to painlessly pop a fly out of your face. And the whole ride back up to the fly shop, we were joking about how he had caught me instead of the fish. <laughs> So one of the other things that I am really passionate about aside from fly fishing is fly tying. Uh, on average I'm tying two to three hours a night every night of the week, if not more, generally working on either personal flies or an order of flies for a customer. So along with tying all that time, I also do demonstrations. I've done two with Trout Unlimited. I did one where they asked me to come in before one of their meetings, sit down and tie, and during that time. I tied this fly right here, it's called a double deceiver, and really taught a couple of people a couple of new uh, fly tying techniques, taught them some new ways to fish. Most people would generally think of a fly like this as a bass fly or a pike fly, something for big, big, big fish, when I'll take and I'll throw this on any of the local rivers around here and catch plenty of fish on it. It's really a predatory response, and most people don't know that, so it was really nice kind of being able to teach people some new things about this and uh, get some new people kind of hooked on throwing those bigger flies. I was also asked to come and tie at their annual fly tying expo. 
At that, they bring the 25 best fly tires in the state there to tie. And being asked to tie, that was a huge honor. That night I took and I tied a lot of flies. I tied the whole, the whole range. I went from those little tiny bugs like I was showing you, all the way up to flies that size and much bigger. Um, that was a great experience and on top of getting out and really showing some people some new techniques, showing them some new ways to fish, I also was able to pick up and learn a lot from walking around and talking with other tires there. So, I sell flies as well. That's one of my big things that I've really started doing recently. I've kind of created my own little side business where I will have people contacting me through Facebook, through my blog, through my YouTube channel and they're seeing the flies that I'm tying, they're thinking it's really cool, they're seeing the fish that are caught on these flies, and they're kind of interested in it, and they're asking for orders of flies. I've tied everything from big giant flies that I've had customers give me the recipe, to having people saying, just go wild with it, tie me up flies that you think will catch fish in this area. I actually just last night picked up a new order for a friend who's going up and fishing Wyoming next weekend, and needs a whole bunch of flies for it. So here's just a couple of pictures of some of my fly tying. These three right here are orders of flies. This one went out to a gentleman in Pennsylvania who needed all of his streamers for his season tied up. This one right here was for a local man who was heading up to the Bighorn River in Wyoming and needed a whole bunch of his own custom pattern tied up. And this was for the same gentleman when he went down to a place called Pyramid Lake in Nevada. It's a very unique lake, has almost a uh, saltwater uh, feel to it and has very unique species. So I tied these leeches, which imitate a species of leech that's only found in that lake. These bait fish patterns imitate a TUI chub, which is only found in that lake. And that imitates a couple of damselfly nymphs that are very rare anywhere else but that lake. Along with that, I tie a lot of personal flies. That right there was tied in one night, that right there was tied in one night, and both of those orders were actually used on those two guide trips that I went out on and had or help people catch fish on them. This right here was a fly pattern that I learned down at that uh, fly fishing expo. I was able to talk to the man who actually originally tied it. He gave me one for free and said, here, go copy it, learn how to do it. And since then I've caught a lot of really big fish on that pattern. And this right here is a pattern that I came up with on my own. I've been tweaking it for the past few months and I've decided on the name the Golden Retriever for it. <laughs> So that pattern right there, um, after a lot of work, a lot of tweaking and changing the weight, changing the materials ever so slightly to get to swim a little different, finally decided on that as the final one. And that's going to be one of many flies that I'll actually be tying at Elkhorn Fly Shop over off of Highway 34 this Saturday. So if you don't have anything going on this Saturday morning <laughs> on time from 10 to noon, feel free to stop by. So kind of hand in hand with my fly tying. I also have been running a YouTube channel for the past three or four years. I'll do fly tying videos, I'll do fishing videos, and just kind of general outdoorsy fishing related stuff. So I'll show you real quick my channel. Let me pull this up. So this channel takes a lot of work to maintain. I generally try to put up a video every month or so, uh, whether it be fly tying or fishing. I generally have a lot more videos in the queue that are ready to be uploaded once the time comes. So I'm going to show you an example of a fishing video and an example of a fly tying video. This is a fishing video that I shot last month. And for anybody who works over at the admin building, the scenery might be a little bit familiar. videos, the amount of editing and work that goes into it is incredible. I spent probably seven plus hours editing this video, finding the right music, and took almost three hours of video and had to cut it down to three minutes.
this video, uh, the night that I went out and shot it, I had been looking at this pond for a little while, and my buddy and I decided we had a couple of hours, so we were going to go look and see if we could pull a couple of really big carp out. And I've been out there, I fished it at lunch that day, caught a smaller fish, and saw a handful of much bigger ones. And this fish completely caught me off guard. The one that I'm hooked up with right now is actually sitting with his head on the shore, sucking on a reed. And what I did is I took one of my custom patterns that I've been working on for the last few years, took and dropped it on his nose, and he absolutely inhaled it. currently the biggest carp that I've caught this year. <laughs> so that's an example of kind of the basic fishing videos that I'll do. And then this right here is uh, one of my basic fly tying videos. So the way that I do these is I will take and kind of speed up the longer, more monotonous parts and then take and slow down, show everybody the materials that are used. So this right here is the pattern that I caught that really big fish on. Uh, I call this my carp craw, and I've been working on it for the last three or so years. Every little bit of this fly has been planned out and changed to fit the needs that I needed to. And I think uh, the best I've done with it was in the month of September last year. I caught over 100 carp on it, and the best day was two fish over 20 pounds. So that right there is a little bit of rabbit strip coming off of the hide. That's used to imitate the mouth of the crayfish, and it really kind of breathes in the water, but still holds that profile. So what I'm doing next is applying a little ball right behind that, so that I can get my claws to splay out really naturally and evenly. That's pheasant-grown feathers, so that comes from the body of a pheasant. What I do is I take them, take two of them off, and those are going to imitate the claws. They have a real nice modern pattern to them, and kind of provide a little bit of a hot spot for those fish to eat. So that right there is some one and a half millimeter thick foam. I've changed the foam. I went from four millimeters thick all the way down to, they call it razor foam. It's about a quarter of a millimeter thick. And it's all uh, in an effort to find the right sink rate. I then tie in some wet dumbbell eyes, and the goal of that is to get the fly to sink and kind of counteract that foam so that it doesn't just float there. At this point, I'm going to take some rabbit dubbies. This comes from the base of a rabbit. It's really spiky. It provides a good buggy look to it. And has just a slight bit of flash built into it. So what I'm doing at this point is trying to build up the head of the crayfish. And one of the big things with this fly is it has a lot of taper to it. It starts really bulky at the head and then tapers down real thin to the tail. So one thing I noticed with a lot of natural crayfish is they have blue built into them in some way. So I decided to take blue wire and use that as a rib to create a segmentation, create the shell back for it, and it adds just a little bit of color to it. I also took to imitate the legs some brown saddle hackles. So this comes from the back of the chicken, and when you wrap it, it really splays and palmers out and spikes out really well. So at this point, I took that same dubbing and I created a really thick, thick body and tapered it back down towards the eye of the hook so that it would create a nice, even uh, tapered fly. I then took and wrapped that hackle through and that creates the legs of the crayfish. 
I trimmed off the top flush so that I can pull that foam down nice and even. And tied that off. And then took that wire and wrapped it through to give the back segmentation. At this point, I finished off the fly with a wick finish that holds it in place so that the thread doesn't come undone. I took, I trimmed off the foam to create the tail, and then to finish it off, I took, uh, this is called UV resin, so it works in the same way that a super glue would, except it doesn't set, it doesn't harden until it's hit with a UV light, a black light, so it allows you to have a little more control over it. So I just applied a little drop of those thread wraps, and this essentially makes the fly bulletproof and destructible. That you have my carp crop. So going into those videos that I make, the time that I spend filming and editing is just exponential. Towards the end of every year, I take the time and I do a. Um, oops, feel bad. Towards the end of every year, I take the time and I do a year in review video. So that's where I take all the footage that I've had and condense it down into about a 10 minute video, just kind of recapping my whole year through. With those, I'm generally dealing with 100 to 150 hours of on the water video, which is a mess to sort through. But the amount of editing, the one that I did last year took probably 20 plus hours to edit and finish completely. Um, the music is another key piece. I spend a lot of time looking for good music that'll really fit the tone of the video. If it's, say, a carp video, I want something kind of upbeat, exciting, happy. If it's a fly tying video, I like generally that kind of electro, deep, bumping bass sort of music that you saw in that fly tying video. But uh, that's kind of my YouTube channel. It's just a lot of fun to run. I also run a Facebook page and a blog. So that's under that same Fishing Northern Colorado brand name that the YouTube page is under. And between the YouTube page, the blog, and the Facebook page, I've kind of gotten a brand name put out there for myself, gotten recognition, and that's how I'm starting to get this fly tying business going. So this blog that I have here, I actually created before I was even in E3. I created it for fun. I'm going way back to when I first started it. The first post I ever put up on here was catching this fish on accident while I was fishing for smallmouth bass. So I created this for fun as just kind of a way to share some fishing adventures, to share some fly tying recipes like this, and eventually as a way to promote my YouTube page. And when I got into the E3 program, Diane had mentioned that I already had a lot of the prerequisites for it done. I had a blog, I had a Facebook page, I had all these things that she was having those students do already done. So most recently, some of the stuff that I've been putting on here is things like this where I'm teaching more than anything technique. So this article right here is about throwing big streamers like those in the winter. In this article I covered um, time spent, like where to spend your time on the river fishing, uh, what kind of cover you're looking for, what kind of gear you're going to want to throw it, uh, different retrieves, all these things that'll help people catch fish more in the winter with these bigger flies. So along with my blog, I also have my Facebook page. This was kind of the last piece I put in place. I have my blog, my YouTube channel, and then my Facebook page. So my Facebook page, um, not a huge page, but it's been more than anything about kind of getting out there, more promotion, and getting this out there more than, say, YouTube would. It's kind of random luck if somebody stumbles onto your video on YouTube. With this, I can take and I can promote posts. I can take, show off, and upload videos on here and then take and post that out so that more people will be seeing it. And most recently what I posted up was when my YouTube channel hit 100 subscribers. I mean, it was a big moment to me to think that 100 people took the time to say, yeah, you know what, I want to see what more of, the, more of this stuff this random kid on the internet's putting up. <laughs> so I wanted to take the time and thank everybody who did that. And if you haven't subscribed already, come <laughs> to know about fishing in Northern Colorado. But in all seriousness, this has been a great way to get out, promote the business, and this has been a key piece in selling my flies as well.
So another thing that I've been doing is for the past few years I've been writing for a website called fishexplorer.com. So this isn't just a writing website, it also has a massive fishing forum and one of the really cool features of it is it takes and it has most of the lakes and rivers in the state and allows the members of the website to take and submit updates in real time. So along with writing for this website, I also kind of take and moderate a couple of lakes and I'm an editor for most of the northern Colorado lakes. So I can go in and change the information on them. So with this, I've been writing since early 2014 and actually one of the first things I put up on here wasn't even about fishing, it was about me struggling in school. It's actually a very personal piece, but I'd love to take the time and read it to you. And so, this was written during my freshman year when I was at the lowest. I was sitting with straight D's and F's going into the end of first semester, and it didn't, didn't look like I was going to be able to pull it out. So I wrote this to kind of share my story with everybody out there. I recently learned a tough lesson, not only when it comes to fishing, but also when it comes to life. I'm a freshman in high school, and I thought that it would be cake, and that I could get off with missing assignment here or there. Not only was I terribly wrong, but I suffered the consequences hard for it. What I didn't realize is how much homework there was, and as more and more of the homework slipped, my grades followed. I then started to feel the effects. As things I enjoyed were stripped away one by one, I realized that I was in deep, and that life was going to suck until I fixed it. Everything I loved was being stripped away until the only things I was allowed to entertain myself with were the thoughts of what I was going to do. To be totally honest, reading this forum in sight was the only thing that kept me on the brink of sanity, even if I couldn't post. My poor choice of me had landed me in a two-month period of not fishing, and by the time finals week rolled around, my grades looked so bad that no one thought I would recover. Finals were a smash, and I got nothing lower than an A or a B, but the consequences were still yet to come. I have a death sentence in the form of a class in summer school awaiting me, and it has me very quickly reorganizing my priorities. I used to be in the mindset of instant gratification, play before work, and I can always fix it at the last second. But what I've really learned is that doing the work first can make the play more fun, and if you wait until the last minute, you're too late, and whatever you're trying to do is going to be jacked up for good. I'm not just trying to vent or spin a yarn, but I'm trying to share a life experience that has changed me for good. As I can see second semester on the horizon, there's only one thing I can think. All I'm telling myself is, Rob, don't screw yourself again. Your fishing rides on this. I'm sharing this moment in my life to get a point across to other people out there, be it young or old, to say that, yeah, you could screw up pretty bad, but if you're always looking forwards and learning from the past, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So that was the first blog I ever put up on here. And after a couple of more guest vlogs, they decided that they could pick me up as a full-time writer on the website. So since then, I've put up quite a few more. Several of them are the same as the vlogs that I'll put up on my personal page. But it's more than anything sharing not only about fishing, but just about helping out the outdoor community and all that. So this is kind of that oddball credit that I was talking about earlier on, that team choices. So when we looked into it, we found that it was really about coping with what's going on and considering everything that I have going on in my life right now, it seemed perfect. So towards the end of last year, my dad sitting back there had slipped and fallen going up the driveway on ice and tore his rotator cuff. We didn't know it at first, we thought it was just a, a pulled muscle, but after it got to a point where he was in some serious pain, we went in and found out that he was going to need some serious surgery for it. So the day after his surgery, my mom had a commitment that she couldn't back out on, and I ended up having to be his personal caretaker for the day. It wasn't the most fun having a grumpy old man who was heavily medicated <laughs> yell at you about his arm hurting every five minutes but it was a big learning experience for everybody. So since then, I had to really take over uh, a lot of the chores around the house, had to do a lot of the work that he was doing and just pick up a lot of responsibility. It was a lot of work. I had to do a lot of the yard work that he would usually do, had to plant the garden, had to help rebuild a fence around it, had to help cut down trees and all this stuff that he would usually be doing. I had to kind of take over for him. He's now doing much better. Um, his physical therapy is paying off. Hey, Dad, you want to wave? <laughs> <laughs> but it's much better, and he's start, we're starting to get back into our normal routine. So at the same time, while I was dealing with that, I was also dealing with my first big, real job. So in the past, I've mowed yards, and I've babysat, and done things like that. 
But late into last summer, I picked up my first real job in an actual workplace. I work at Battlezone Arena over in the outlet malls at Loveland. It's a full-time Nerf War arena. The games are a lot, they're similar to paintball or laser tag, but instead of using those, we have soft Nerf darts and Nerf guns. It's a lot of fun, and if any of you have young kids, I urge you to go over and try it out. It's a great way to spend an hour and tire them out really well. <laughs> So dealing with that job, it's a lot of work. You have to deal with impatient kids, impatient parents, people who don't listen. You have to stand up to people older than you. Since it's a mostly teenage staff, having to deal with angry adults and angry customers is a little intimidating and it takes a lot of work to get used to it and to really stand your ground and have to deal with that. But it's been an absolutely incredible learning experience working there and it's been a fun job too. I can't complain. One of the other big things that I had to cope with this year was um, changing school districts. I've been in the Pooter district for five years, had my friend circle deeply rooted in there, and being plucked and thrown into essentially a brand new school was, it was tough. I had a very small class schedule, so that gave me less time to really find friends and find a group to hang out with. And on top of that, I mean, changing districts itself has a lot of differences, uh, curriculum differences, things that I hadn't learned over in Pooter that uh, they're like normal knowledge in Thompson. It was a big change that I had to deal with, but I've coped fairly well with it. E3 has been a big part of that. Spending time here um, has really helped out, and I've gotten to know a lot of people in the district better. It's, it's a fun district. I'm glad that I made the change. And that is it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you for watching. Rob, I remember when you came in a year ago and how quiet and shy you were, and even in the beginning of this year. And just to watch you blossom has just been amazing. Thank you. And so just kudos to you for what you have overcome and where you were when you read that article. You know, it's where you are now, a confident, articulate young man who really, I mean, heck, you talked about English, you talked about math, you talked about science, you talked about pretty much everything, geography, you know, of northern Colorado and fishing, you know, it's like, you pretty much, on my, <laughs> in my mind, you have definitely demonstrated confidence. Thank you. Mine too. I, I have the unique position of spending an awful lot of time with Rob because he works on his Thompson Online work every day with me. This young man knows more about Colorado water than anyone I could ever hope to meet. He has shared so much and taught me so much. Uh, it's, it's amazing. You're an amazing young man and I am so fortunate that you chose E3. So excellent job on your, your presentation and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions, comments, mom, dad? Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> he That's assures me he gets to go fishing tomorrow if he did well. So. Yes. Because <laughs> it's his birthday tomorrow. It's his birthday Yay. tomorrow. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. 17 tomorrow.